Damn, that intro was totally badass. Thank you so much to Dave Lizzo, guitarist for the band Nonpoint, for creating me my new intro. I was so honored that you took the time out of the kindness of your heart to do that for me, Dave. So thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Try This at Home with Dana Martin. I'm your host, Dana, and I'm here tonight with my son, Devin, who's co-hosting. Hello, everybody. We are here in uh, Madison, New Hampshire, live free or die state. The homeschooling regulations have changed this year, so I'm really excited about to share about that with you. For a lot of years, we've had to hire an evaluator and do testing and jump through a lot of hoops to legally homeschool, and they've recently become a lot more free. So we only have to do it and um, fill out a letter of intent and just kind of on our own keep track of our children's progress. But that is such huge advancements and freedom for New Hampshire, so thank you so much. I want to thank UCY. I, I love this radio network. I think um, I'm really honored to be here, and they're always their communication is so positive, and they always answer my questions right away. So just to, I, I don't really take enough time to thank UCY, and I wanted to take some time to do that tonight. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I'm doing a couple of parenting coaching calls tonight, so I'm anxious to have my uh, parents call in so I could, well, not my parents, but other people's <laughs> parents call in to answer some questions. And what did we do this week, Dev? This week, what was your, your Devin's main focus was, was building a forge, taking his forge and putting it inside. And Devin's been a blacksmith for a couple months now. And pursuing that interest and passion was something that um, has been a lot to facilitate. The older the kids get, the more their interests and passions expand, and the facilitation becomes more challenging, but at the same time, really rewarding. And uh, so where did you learn and I really don't know the answer to this. How did you learn how to move the forge from outside to inside? Well, I mean, um, it was mostly all set to go. All I had to do was I brought it in, but I, to make the hood for the fire, I cut a barrel, a barrel, and uh, I had some stove pipe, and I just basically, my dad helped me cut a hole in the roof, and I put the chimney up it, and all the smoke goes up there. I've had no issues with it, so. Yeah, I think that's one of the challenges for me as a unschooling parent sometimes is, I mean, we all struggle with different aspects, and I'm a very trusting person, but when it comes to safety, when it's something new, I really have to talk myself down sometimes. I walked into the woodshed, or what used to be the woodshed is now Devon's Forge, and saw that his bucket of water, what is that called? I know the quenching name. bucket. The quenching bucket was kind of close to <laughs> electrical outlets. And now the electrical outlets are totally screwed into the wall, but I just had this image of, I think as parents, we all have like our things that we fear. And they're more than likely irrational, but they're just something that's kind of triggers for us. And I know where my fear stemmed from. I, I have feared like the kids in electrocution has been like my biggest fear. And it's really ridiculous, actually, but I know where it came from. I remember being probably around six years old, and my parents tell me I couldn't watch a certain show that was on television that was a movie on. And because they weren't in a position, I mean, they, they did what they felt was best. It was positive intentions. But because they forbid me to see it, of course, I went in my room and <laughs> snuck on the channel, and I watched it. And a, a girl was in a bathtub, and somebody came in and threw a radio in the bathtub, and it electrocuted her. And I swear, it traumatized me. I, like, saw it. I would have been so much more um, not affected by it if I would have had freedom to watch it and had a parent watching it with me. But because I was forbidden, I kind of went outside my comfort zone. And ever since then, I've been fearful of electrocution. So maybe I need some, like, hypnosis to get over that. Or but maybe you have to get moderately electrocuted. No. <laughs> I know people think that harming somebody with their fear is going to cure them of it. I don't I don't know. I don't What do you guys think? I have no idea. I'm not feeling so cuz dad you that used to make fun of me about well not only that but like my fear of bees. And he used to joke around and say I'm going to take a jar full of bees and put it on your stomach and your It's funny cuz dad's like so not afraid of bees. Like, he pet one once. I know. But he's petrified <laughs> of fire. Yeah. So isn't that interesting that that's always his thing with, with you? And it's not that he yeah. doesn't want you to have fire. He's afraid of, like, forest fire. So I, I think there is a, a balance between freedom and cautiousness mm -hmm. and giving information. So I think as a parent with with a child as they get older, you really have the opportunity to work through your fears and work together in partnership and talk about them. There's been times where I've said to Devin, like, I, I know this isn't you. It's just my thing but I'm just feeling fearful about this. And he's so much more apt to, he, he'll move that water, the quenching bucket over for me, even though 
it was a little bit maybe irrational he, because I told him it was kind of my thing and my fear and I would just feel better if it was moved. He totally respected it because I wasn't threatening. I wasn't, I don't know. Would you agree that you were more, Yeah. you were just more receptive? <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing looking at you. Devin's face is co covered in coal right now. You look like a coal miner. <laughs> I'm just wearing my white tank top that I got today. It's, well, it's black now. <laughs> Devin's I've always covered in coal from blacksmithing. And yeah, today you were sawdust and coal together. <laughs> so to, what else did we do today? Devin and I walked four miles today. Mm -hmm. Devin walked barefoot most of it. I don't know how the heck he did it. But we are training for the Spartan race. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It's a obstacle race. This particular one's in the Boston area, and it's our first time doing it. Why do you want to do it? Well, I, th I mean, I just think it will be fun. To I've never done anything like that, and I like climbing over things and swimming in things and <laughs> almost dying of heat stroke. So, um, you think we'll almost die of <laughs> no, heat stroke? No, I don't. Oh, I didn't but... even think of the heat factor. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just think it'll be fun. I have a friend who's a personal trainer, my friend Kathy, and she asked me if I wanted to do this with her. And we're, we're not a family who's into competitive sports, really. I mean, if any of my kids were interested, I would support it and facilitate it, but no one ever has been. So something like a race, I mean, we know we're not going to come in first. We just want to finish it. So it's a three-mile run and then 13 obstacles, and they're really crazy obstacles. Some are running through fire or going in swamp, the swamp I don't water. I about that. Well... I, I'm excited, but I'm nervous. It's kind of like I just want to do it to prove to myself that I could do it. And so I've had a lot of fun getting into shape and walking four miles today was really great. And not only that, but I love that time with you, that focused time, yeah. because even though, you know, we're all home together as a family and I love it, but we're, we're all just so busy facilitating our own interests and needs and everybody's kind of off doing their own thing. So it was so cool to have that focused time. Devin taught me so much about trees and nature that I didn't know. Tomorrow, he and I are taking a class, actually. Yeah, at a, hope yeah. we don't miss that. Cause I thinking we're, gonna... we're not going to miss it. I'll, I know. I'm up at, like, between 7 and 8, and I'll wake you up for it. It's not till 11, so okay. we'll be able to make it. Okay. It's a edible, what is it, wild edibles. Medicinal plants and tree identification. Yeah, it was something that I wanted, that Devin showed some interest in, and so I started to scour the Internet for different classes or opportunities to expand on that for him, and we found this particular one, which happened to only be Right in the next town, so I'm excited to do that. We had to walk to his probably. <laughs> well, we miles, we but... talked. No way, it's way further. I <laughs> think. So. I think we could probably ride a bike to it, but after today, the, the walk, that was long, man. I, I really pushed myself for that, but it was great. It felt good. I wanted to do it every other day, but Devin thinks once a week's good to go on that particular walk. Well, if you walk two weeks, but I just think you did it like. <laughs> yeah, we kind of get bored. Like, yeah. Okay. So what did you make today? Well, I, I finished the handle on my workish dagger, and I made a. I'm making a meat cleaver. The handle is drying right now. The glue is drying on it. I'm gonna go finish it after this. Where do you gain your most inspiration for these kind of knives, um, or just the whole profession of blacksmithing in general? I don't know. I like doing what our ancestors did. And most people don't, you know, do it anymore. So kind of fun to do something that not a lot of people do, but people don't really believe me when I tell them that I'm a blacksmith. Usually they don't know what it is, so. Well, the interesting thing is we live in such a future-based existence and children aren't taken seriously that they are something now, that when somebody says, what do you want to be when you grow up? I mean, Devin's like, I'm already, I'm already that now. I'm, I don't need to worry about that. I don't know what I'll be when I'm 30, but for now I'm a blacksmith. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it's really impressive to me. I was talking to Devin today about how whatever he does, he does with such passion, and he becomes an expert in whatever he does. So he's And he's a natural teacher and inspirer. So I feel like no matter what he does, he's always going to be able to inspire somebody. But we're thinking of having blacksmithing classes just because I really believe, and I've written an article about this recently, that people learn and really solidify their learning through teaching others. There's no saying about it. I wish I knew it off the top of my head, but something about teaching somebody else something really solidifies 90% of the knowledge that you're trying to get across. And it's all part of the learning process. So I think in the unschooling community, the unschooling philosophical perspective, the word teach is kind of looked down upon because we don't look at ourselves as our child's teachers. I don't stand in front of my kids pouring knowledge into them. I'm not telling them that what I think that they should know. 
I trust them, but I love, I, I think we need to take back the word teach and use it where it's more positively influential. And that's for our children to be teachers because when they teach and inspire other people that are willing to learn it is all part of the learning continuum. And it's a really beautiful thing. So I wish all of you listening lived close by so you can utilize these awesome talents that my son has if you're interested. But yeah, I was just going to say, if anyone lives in our area, I'd love to do a class with them, preferably someone who's over the age of like 10, just because I don't think they'll be able to do it if they're under that age. It takes quite a bit of strength. Well, I have, yeah, to do it faster is, it needs a lot of strength, but I mean, you can do the same amount um, with not a lot of strength, it just takes a lot longer. Mm, definitely. Okay, so we watched, what movies did we watch this week? We're kind of been into movies lately. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Your watched. favorite movie, Anchorman 2. It's my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> it's hard. Daddy's not like, Joe's not into like stupid Daddy. comedy. I know. Into like stupid comedies, he calls them. I don't think they're stupid. He just I the think stupid type. So stupid. Well, I mean, but I love them. Yeah, <laughs> they're just ridiculously stupid. What is your favorite like quote, like from the movie? Some of your favorite quotes. Uh, one of my favorites is um when Champ is ex- says um the cats are chicken of the rail yard. <laughs> 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 There's a an Anchorman one when they're warming up to go live on air. What are we, we just, see every time before I go on air on this radio show, Devin and I have a joke and I and I do it. But what is it like the Green Lantern? He, he always has. Um, he always warms up with different random fake news stories, and some of them are like. Well, he does voice exercises too, and he'll go, "Unique New York, unique New York." Ow, <laughs> now, brown cow. He'll do that, and then the fake stories are like, "The Human Torch is denied a bank loan," or "The, the Tarantula is enjoying a fine chewing gum." <laughs> <laughs> or the arsonist has oddly, the arsonist has oddly shaped feet. <laughs> <laughs> so before I go on air, oh, it's so hard to stay serious sometime when Devin's in my presence because we just crack, you know, it cracks me up. Well, I'm supposed to get a couple columns tonight. We're going to go with the flow of technology and see who comes through. <clears throat> in the meantime, I would love to uh, talk about a few things. I posted on my Facebook page today a question, and I got a lot of responses, and they're still coming in. Uh, almost continuously every minute <laughs> that I posted it, but I put, what are your biggest challenges to unschooling and peaceful parenting? And there's so many different challenges that people are facing. And in my advocacy, I love to stay positive. I mean, this life is all about positivity and focusing on the cup being half full and a pessimistic negative culture. How do we focus on joy? But I think it's really important too, to acknowledge that there are challenges to this life. And I think through people, being honest about them, we can help shift through. I mean, there's challenges to any life, but if you're being presented this philosophy in such a way that is unrealistic and really dogmatic, I think you just tend to think like judge yourself so much against that. So we all deal with challenges and I'm going to talk about mine a little bit later, but um, let's see. Let's read one or two. And I'd love to get Devin. Devin, do you want to, Devin's wood burning. Sorry, his I'll, knife handle. Well, it doesn't matter to me. I just wanted your input on some of these. If you're yeah, interested, if you're interested, um, breaking away from all my conditioning. That's a big one. Somebody posted that. I think just, uh, recognizing your conditioned responses to things, even if you don't know where they came from. I was working with a coaching client last night and we were talking about just that, that sometimes when you're really triggered by something somebody says or one of your kids says to really just not not engage in any kind of debate when you're in a reactive state. You know, reaction just causes um, just dysfunction within the dynamic of the situation. So that's one of the biggest tips, not just for communicating with your kids, but communicating with anybody that if someone's triggering you and you're feeling really reactive and defensive to just not communicate from that place. So just kind of breathe through it, notice it. And um, I think the things that trigger people are things like if their kids are really young and they're asking for something, and that they're in the living room and the parents in the kitchen or whatever, and the child just, you know, kind of yells out, I want a drink. And it really triggers parents because if they would have asked their parents in such a way, 
they would have been punished for it. It was all about manners and obedience for most of us growing up. And so you're kind of triggered and these old tapes play in your head. And that's conditioning. These old tapes are conditioning. When you hear things like, I'm not your slave and um, I'm not going to respond unless you ask politely. You know, a three-year-old is doing the best they can with what they know. And when you're focused on the needs under the behavior, I like to tell people to respond to their kids unconditionally, regardless of how they ask. And as kids get older, and when you respond respectfully, kids are just, they learn so much more from that, from forcing them to say please and thank you when they don't really authentically feel gratitude. They learn to really not feel gratitude and just kind of parrot things. Where I know if my kids thank me for something, they're not being forced. I've never said <clears throat> ever, what do you say to any of them? And I know that I don't always say please when I ask my husband or my kids for something. I, I try to, but we, who, who says that all the time? And so because I have the understanding, I extend that to them. So I, I think the cultural conditioning is huge and recognizing what's conditioned and what's reactive. So I'm hoping part of the, the goal of this parenting is that our kids aren't going to have any cultural conditioning. My kids are pretty much whole people the way that they are. I think a lot of kids living this life are, and they don't have this kind of conditioning and reactive stuff. Let's see. Somebody posted um, time to myself. That's such a big one, especially with young kids. I think as my kids have gotten older, more and more time for myself has really opened up. But it took a while, especially breastfeeding and co-sleeping. And um, I think it's really important to take time. Is that your wood burning that smells like that? Wow. Probably, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can just it off. No, it's okay. I don't, I don't mind. Know. I just... The smell might just linger. I don't know. It's, <clears throat> it's not the worst smell ever. Just burning wood smell. Um... If Devin say that, like Tiffany screamed for someone to get a drink, or one of the younger kids did, asked for a drink. I mean, I think that Devin has said to the kids, the younger kids before, like, can you be a little nicer about it? Like, he's in a state of recognizing when things kind of sound rude. Mm -hmm. don't, don't you think? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Unschooling chaos is another challenge that somebody posted. My son is a wild boy. Very challenging for me. My daughter had no peace and asked to go to school. Wow, that's a pretty big one. And I think it's really important that if your child's challenging and it's bothering your other children, to take the responsibility to be the, the sole person to engage with that child so they're not bothering your other children or harming them or being disrespectful. And I think that's so hard. That's a really hard, hard call. But I've reminded several parents before coaching that that is your responsibility if it is upsetting your other children. So um, I don't know the full story, obviously, with just a comment on Facebook, but there's lots of different ways that you can facilitate your younger children being you know, occupied. But it is, that's part of this life. This isn't unparenting. This isn't a hands-off approach where just you, you let your kids um, kind of free range. I mean, obviously, free range parenting is, is, is similar to this in the sense that my children have the freedom to do what they want with their time. But there is a fine line between neglect and connected parenting. Again, I'm not saying this particular parent falls in that category at all. I'm just kind of using it as a jumping off place for um, sharing that if you have a child bothering the other one, it's your responsibility to distract and go engage. It should be a sign to go engage with your other child, start a craft, start a project, do something fun, or find something uh, for your other child to do to maybe leave the house and go over a friend's house and just get away. I think that's one of the, one of the challenges for us as a family. I mean... <clears throat> We love being together, but there's times where it's really hard when everyone's together all the time. As much as I love my husband, there's times where I just want him to go out in the shop, and only because the energy is different. You know, we all need natural space from each other, and I'm a real in, you know, introvert. And so him being an extrovert, the energy is always so intense. And, and the same with, with Tiffany. She's a real extrovert, and the energy yeah. is always really intense. <clears throat> I can vouch for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I can't say, and the other hard thing is, well, anyway, let me just finish with this. So, you know, finding that time away, there's been times where I've just asked some of the kids, you guys want to go for a drive? Do you want to go do something? Once I can get out in nature and kind of recharge, I'm feeling better. But in the winter, it's hard sometimes with everybody kind of all together all the time. Cabin fever. Yeah. It was <laughs> bad this year. Oh, man. So it's so great to be able to get away. And how do you say it to someone lovingly without it hurting their feelings? You know, I... I'm learning how to navigate that myself and just be able to peacefully communicate that. Why don't we just uh, get away from each other for a minute? I think kids in school are stuck with the same group of kids all day, every day. That must be really hard, especially when it's people they don't like because 
I mean, gosh, I love my family and I love being around them. I can't imagine being forced to sit next to somebody you don't like all day, every day. I mean, I know that I was in that category many years ago, but I guess you just get to a place of acceptance. So over the years, Devin, with your siblings, I think it's important to say that we, um, as peacefully and lovingly as we live and promote, it's not always peaceful. I do call it peaceful chaos, but um, the sibling rivalry is hard, especially the ages that everybody's getting. When they're little, really young, it's a little different. You're dealing with somebody grabbing a toy from the other person. But these kids, man, they're, they're getting older. And honestly, how do you feel about your siblings, like one by one, starting with Tiff? Well, me and Tiffany get into debates a lot about everything. Um, like what? Diet. Um, a lot of times when I say I have to go out and work, she criticizes how I'm not working. Um, um, sorry. Why does so, she say, like, if she says that you're not working? I don't know. She's like, <clears throat> uh, then I, I don't know. And then I looked up, the, um, I looked up the meaning of the word work and I read it to her and she was still mad at me, but <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Um, but over the year, I mean, you guys have not been the closest siblings. You and Tiffany really butt heads personality wise. Mm -hmm. It's been challenging. And I think that I kind of, I think you have to work through as a parent. You tend to evaluate yourself as a parent by how great your kids get along sometimes. And when they don't, it's easy to be triggered to think that you're doing something wrong, mm -hmm. especially living this peaceful life. When your kids aren't being peaceful, you wonder, did they learn it from me? Am I doing something wrong? What am I modeling? Are they picking up on my anger? We just tend to really overanalyze instead of realizing that, these kids are together all the time. Nature wants them to learn how to work out problems. It's part of life. Siblings get along 50% of the time, and they argue and fight 50% of the time. And if you can just not judge it as negative. I think we get along better than 50% of the time. But. Yeah, definitely. I'd say so. So how do you feel about um, Ivy? I think me and her get along probably, well, I don't know. Um, me and her and get along really well. We've never actually had a fight before. Uh, sometimes if Ivy's feeling stupid, then she would um, <laughs> we in her fights. But I think me and Ivy spend more time together than anyone else. Um, me and Ryan get along really well, though. He looks up to you so much. He yeah. wants to be just like you. I don't know about that. I think he wants to be a computer person. But really? Yeah. I, I always sense that he just like looks up at you with such adoration. I don't just... think he wants to be a blacksmith. No. <laughs> De Devin has a prediction that Orion's going to be like a, what did you say? AT&T or like a, what, what he's going to make a break, uh, he's going to make a breakthrough in video game technology, or he's going to work at ITT Technical Institute, <laughs> or <laughs> something like, something like that. He's a real techie, Orion. He's, he's so, tech savvy. He is, and he's very introverted, and he doesn't say much. Like, he does, he does at a certain time at night. He seems to, like, emotionally yeah. wake up, but, like, like, he barely talks in it, like, for, like, an hour. He's, like, very articulate about everything. Yeah, extremely so. It's really cute. But yeah, you and Ivy seems, you seem to mentor Ivy and she's really interested in what you're doing. It seems like more than the well, other she's kids. forged before. She's done some work working stuff and yeah. I noticed this year you and Tiffany connecting as teens more than the other kids for sure. Yeah. I think we get along better, but me and her are so such opposites um, in the way of she is so involved with technology and mainstream pop culture and I'm totally not. <laughs> I mean Yeah, you guys couldn't be more different. I think it bothers me when I hear her when I hear both of you, it's so hard to listen to both of you criticize each other. Give an example. Oh, when she says something to you like your hair is long and looks silly or her hair is twice as long as mine. I know. She's in so into pop culture she has an her ideal I you know, an idea of what the way people should look sometimes based on her. Now she's getting into makeup and I know she's gonna ask for expensive things. So it's not okay. <laughs> I think Devin, Devin takes issue with Tiffany buying into consumerism. He feels as though she buys into consumerism. I know so. She does. I mean, are you denying that? No, I don't think I should. <laughs> I don't think, I think she does. I don't know. Like, I think I just have such a positive outlook. Like, I, I totally know. You are against consumerism. You're against buying into anything, even remotely having to do with uh, the man or anyone, you know, anything. Popular, you don't want any part of. I'm trying to understand. The man is popular. I think that's like government. 
Yeah, you know what I'm I mean. I'm not saying to break the laws. I'm just saying to break society. Exactly. <laughs> and I love that about you. I, I love your anti-cultural perspective. However, I do want to meet Tiffany where she's at. And I think that's an important aspect of parenting this way. I wouldn't be any better than a mainstream parent focused on obedience and control if I tried to con- control all my kids to be like Devin. And, you know, Devin is, like, for an unschooling parent, Devin is someone who um, people are really impressed with. He, he has his own business. He's a real self-starter. He, he works hard. He loves what he does. He's always creating, always expanding, always growing. And I think it's so important to honor who all my kids are equally. I totally respect what Tiff said, and she wants to, She's learning about makeup. No, yeah, she asked for fifty dollar makeup yesterday for eyeshadow, but I think that's a great unbelievably ridiculous. That's the most that was by far the most ridiculous thing she's ever asked for in her life. (laughs) Well (laughs) the interesting thing was how she she learned about makeup application through this one particular YouTube channel. That's why I don't like stuff like pop culture. She just assumed that's the only way. But no, she was so she was actually so open to hearing my opinion. No, I understand, but she thought that was the only way because she didn't research enough that she should have. Well, I agree, but she is learning as she goes. So she, but she was really open to hear my perspective on it. So I wasn't, you know, I didn't say, no, you can't have that. I said, well, I mean, I'm happy to research eyeshadow with you, but you know, fifty dollars is ridiculous for. I, I would have said no. You can't get that. Would you have? So if you have a daughter someday and you're living this life, if she says fifty dollar makeup, that's unbelievably unbelievable. But what I'm saying is, I totally hear you and I agree wholeheartedly. However. You can say yes to the eyeshadow, but no to the name brand Sephora fifty dollar eyeshadow. Well, yeah, but she's asking for the main brand fifty dollar Sephora eyeshadow. Well, she was receptive when I said, "Sweetie, we're not in a position to be able to buy that for you right now." I mean, so honesty is important, and there's real life financial limitations. So how do you go about discussing that with your kids? You have to be honest. This isn't about saying yes to everything, in the sense of it, it breaking you financially. I mean, I think you can say, yeah, we're well, totally down with researching eyeshadow for you, which I did. I sat with her for half an hour, and we even researched the ingredients and discovered that the ingredients are the same in a cheaper brand for three, three, four dollars. And she was like, all right, that's fine. But Tiffany's, Tiffany's always been a, somebody who um, wants things. She's always been very thing oriented. For sure, definitely. I mean, I don't know what she do without her iPad or anything like that. Well, I mean, I think it's a window to the world for a lot of kids. They get to yeah. research, and she loves learning how to make videos. She has her own YouTube channel. Do you think you could live without your iPad? Uh, does that mean we still have our computers? <laughs> well, because I need to learn how to do stuff. Right. I don't want to go spend a bunch of money on books. <laughs> I well, like you books could... more than the internet, but I don't like... I can't just be like, hmm, I wonder how this happens. I should go buy a $20, $30 book well, about fact, it. Do you know that it wasn't very long ago that we had to do that? Oh, I know. Isn't that amazing? I know. Just, just literally, and since you, the, the year before you were born is when we got the internet. Um, I think, uh, what was it? I think it was encyclopedias that we used more than anything. Encyclopedia, that's what it's called. <laughs> Why does it, why do you say it's pronounced that way? <laughs> Encyclopedia? No, it's a joke. Oh, oh. It's a on how your mother said that. Oh, okay. <laughs> how I Met Your Mother. You know, it's interesting because certain aspects of pop culture, I don't even know if you call it pop culture, but you really appreciate and enjoy the certain shows that you love, The Big Bang Theory. Yeah, I met your I mother. Would, I wouldn't call that the pop culture is pop culture is popular culture. And um I think mean, I don't think those shows are big with that sort of thing. I, I believe Minecraft is pop culture. I don't think the Big Bang Theory or just because they're popular, I don't think that they're necessarily pop culture. Like Game of Thrones is pop culture, but Vikings isn't. Even though I actually like Vikings more, but um <laughs> I just think it's it depends on how the company advertises and their like Duck Dynasty is pop culture. Oh yeah. And um it all depends on how it's being sold. But do you think that so somebody who's drawn to something like Tiffany loves One Direction. She loves the music and her Really? Heart. I didn't know that. I didn't know And she that loves the her. music in her heart and soul. So is it off limits just because it's pop culture? If something you truly liked, like say you truly like no, something. No, I'm just saying I don't like pop culture. Personally, I don't like it. Yeah, I, I'm not saying she shouldn't. I'm just saying I am not going to. <laughs> I hear you. 
What if your children wanted to? What if you had a child? They won't, they won't like it. <laughs> really? Yeah, they won't like it at all. Because I'm gonna, I'm gonna, second they're born, I'm gonna be like, okay, let's go for some stuff. And then they're gonna rebel against me and they're gonna like pop culture. Yeah, <laughs> see, you just walked your, you just walked yourself into that story, into the truth. Maybe I'm glad I should you... get them really involved in pop culture then. And then ah, slippery slope. I know. Maybe isn't I just it? won't have, maybe I'll just adopt a kid who already likes everything I like. You could. <laughs> <laughs> It is interesting because I think when you have an ideal and you have an agenda, no matter what it is in your life as a parent, and you try, I mean, there's a fine line between educating and, and supporting and fearing and controlling. You know, Tiffany, on the other hand, is so receptive to animal rights, and she is not pop culture at all when it comes to her choice for veganism. I think with media she is, but when it comes to she is really strong in, uh, for animal rights. She does not buy into the industry of, of popular food. She's against, she reads the ingredients on every single thing yeah, before she buys it. And so it's, it's interesting how you might categorize somebody as into pop culture when in fact it really is just media with her. She really, really loves, um, I love facilitating for her that aspect of her. So you all have different components and you all have different sides too. And so it's important not to label your kids in that way. And I, I support them unconditionally, no matter what they're into. Ivy is not really so much, Ivy's, really middle of the road, isn't she? She likes... She's a weird girl. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to feel about her yet. Oh, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not all. Ivy's my little buddy. I feel, I feel like if Tiffany wasn't into pop culture, I wouldn't be either. I really feel like she's just copying Tiffany. Because all of a sudden, she's into makeup now. Well, Tiffany's giving her all her old makeup. Yeah, but if she wasn't, then if, if Tiffany didn't start researching makeup, I don't think Ivy would be interested in either. If Tiffany never left One Direction, I don't think Ivy would have either. Well, isn't it interesting how siblings really do influence one another? Because she really loved what you're into as well. She was really just as open. She just is mentored by her older siblings, and she's really just open to supporting it all. Same with Orion. Orion yeah. got into Minecraft. Ivy was right into it. Ivy just loves experiencing everything without judgment. She's open to all of it, and she'll also eat anything. Yeah. You know, she's right on board. She's just an open she book. She won't eat venison. Well, we've never had it. She, she might. Well, she claims she will not eat it. Yeah. I think I've it just it. sounds kind of gross. Why? I don't know. You don't want to eat it either? Well, I'm vegan, Devin. I'm not going to oh, eat venison. Oh, right. I forgot, I forgot that. <laughs> I'm happy to support and I'll even make it for you. Well, would you eat it if you weren't vegan, though? Yeah. Oh. I had before. My, my dad oh. growing up was a hunter and we had wild game. I never liked it. It was too gamey tasting. I but... don't think it's any different. I don't know. I don't know. Who, where, when did you have it? I had it in like every other day. I had it all the time there. Okay. And not every other day. I've had it like eight times there. So yeah, not at all every other day. Anyways. Well, it seems tech, technology has um, affected something. And so I'm just going to keep flowing with the show. And um, I'll have my callers next week. It's fine. They keep getting a busy signal. What's happening is sometimes I think I have so many people calling at once that they keep hitting each other with a busy signal. That's what happened last week, and nobody can get through. So um, let's continue on here. Consistency. That was an answer that somebody put on this. What is your biggest challenge is consistency. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. The whole idea of being consistent. I think that's a really kind of misleading term for a lot of people in our culture. I think parenting-wise... Um, we are put in a position where people tell us we're weak if we don't enforce, 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 and be consistent. And what the word consistent is really a nice soft word in place of being tough. Um, the whole tough love idea, and you have to be consistent because that's what kids want. Well, that's not reality, and that's really false, and it just kind of perpetuates the authoritarian paradigm. So I think the way that it's used when somebody says consistency I mean, we can chat about that for a little while here. I think um, one thing I say to people is I go with the flow of the moment and I don't have set rules or set boundaries. We discuss things as they come up. The only consistency that I feel is important in parenting is to be um, consistently loving and consistently present. And so but when somebody says they have an issue with consistency, I, I like to kind of walk them around to really truly think about what that word means. I mean, you can have a consistent container of being loving and present and that, to me, means to be open to each situation for discussion. Consistency in the way that it's met in mainstream culture is really due to 
uh, punishments and enforcing and standing by what you said. And, and it's all punitive. I said that I'm going to be consistent and follow through and say, no, you can't go to that school dance because I already said it. All right, well, lately, Tiffany and I and Ivy have been really into the, the cheesy Lifetime movies. We kind of oh, my God. We better not set to, like, a little binge with them. I don't like them, okay? I do not. Well, they're, I think they're, they're, they're all the same. I, pretty much. But they're, <laughs> they're fascinating, I think, for the girls to see. We And they're really informative. For young girls um, becoming teenagers, ta- learning about uh, – they, they have one on anorexia. And the girls are fascinated with the, the issues and the problems that modern teenage girls face today. And a lot of them focused on that. Uh, drinking and, and sex before marriage and all these different focuses. Now I'm completely supportive of whoever my children want to be and I give them information. But when I say sex before marriage, I mean like how looked down upon it is and all these movies that the, the girls are considered bad um, and wrong and um, tramps if they do that kind of thing or um, they sneak out of their window. The girls are just so fascinated with why a girl would sneak out of her window Um why a girl would shoplift or why a girl would be anorexic and, and how sad the undertone of sadness is fascinating for my girls to watch. And for me too, kind of, because it reminds me of what we really live in. I think it's important to remember the culture that we live in because it can, it can be so easy to get kind of in this community and culture that we've created and surrounding ourselves with people with a that are peacefully parenting in a partnership paradigm, I think it's really easy to just kind of forget what's happening in the outside world. And every time I do a coaching call, I get brought to that reality of the truth of what we're, what we're going through right now. So I love that it's informative that my girls can see what most other girls go through. They've known girls. They have friends in New York who have um, kids in the school system. And um, they're friends with me now on Facebook, a lot of these girls. And they write me messages all the time about wanting to unschool, that they just are so um, enthralled with the idea of being free and pursuing their own interests and passions. So it's really cool for um, these Lifetime movies. What was I even getting at with the Lifetime movies thing? We started on a track of something. And I forgot my train of thought, but it's okay. Somebody posted about um, unwelcomed comments about unschooling and peaceful parenting from others. You know, when you're a pioneer and you're on the forefront of change, it is you are we are putting ourselves out there for criticism and we are being brave and doing so because not everybody could handle it. I mean, I have so many people say to me, you're so brave. How do you even how do you do that? And it makes me sad because I realized that so many people were so beaten down and criticized and their own self value lies and how other people feel about them. That's been such a hard journey as an advocate myself, not only as an unschooling parent, but then an advocate on top of it. I love to encourage other people to be advocates and um, promote this life if they're feeling drawn to do so. But um, it is hard to put yourself out there for criticism. And I think it's just opening your heart to understanding that people don't know what you know about it. People aren't judging you because they don't understand the whole philosophy. I mean, it takes so long to even really wrap your head around what partnership parenting is and unschooling is. That when most people are judging it and commenting on it, they're going by a sensationalized media approach or what they think it is. They, they hear unschooling and they instantly feel they hear unparenting and uneducating. That's why a lot of people don't like the label unschooling. I love the label radical unschooling, actually, because I think it um, really celebrates. Um, it stands for what this life is not, but also the radical side of it um, really wakes people up and makes them curious. And because it's such a a radical label. People want to look more into it. And once they realize that it's not so strange and it makes perfect sense, they're more open to it. If, uh, if they're drawn to it and open to it, I think the label is a more positive view, but I know it's hard. So opening your heart to understanding when somebody doesn't understand this life and they criticize it, just saying like meeting them where they're at, a partnership dynamic can happen with anybody, not just your kids. And that's part of, the growth on this path is that you need to understand that you're never done and you're always growing. And you first kind of extend this philosophy to your children. That's the first step. And then we move in ever widening circles and we try to extend it to our partners, focusing on the needs under our partner's behavior. We've talked about that on the show a lot. And then extending it even further outward, let that circle go outward to friends and family, focusing on the needs under their behavior, under their criticism. Most people don't know how to do anything. um, But, 
criticize or play devil's advocate because we live in such a pessimistic culture. That's what was done with us. So meeting somebody where they were at, if they made a comment like, um, how can you parent this way? It seems really neglectful or how are your kids ever going to learn? Just smiling and being positive and just being like, I hear you. I, I, I would have never believed it myself. I felt that if I, you know, I felt the way, the way that you do not too many years ago until I really learned about it. It's, it's fascinating. And so I'm really happy to answer any questions you have. And being really open hearted, I think when we do the cultural conditioning, once again, going back to that, that when somebody says something like that, we feel attacked and we kind of shut our heart down and we kind of pull ourselves inward and we get defensive. And I love the quote by Byron Katie that defense is the first act of war. Because it's true. Anytime you feel that defense creep up within you, you know that you're starting something. It's a negative battle. It's an authoritarian dynamic of push and pull. It's a power struggle. It's you versus them. When you choose never to get in that dynamic with somebody, you realize your power because you can't fight with somebody that doesn't fight back. You can't argue with somebody who um, is challenging in you and you just understand being understanding and empathetic. Like, I hear you. I felt the same way. So how can I help you understand? Are you interested in learning more? Do you want me to give you some resources? And then we could have a discussion about it again. So unwelcomed comments. You can either just be empathetic about them, focus on the needs under the person's behavior, because sometimes we really trigger people, man. What we stand for is a level of freedom that most people can't even imagine living with, with somebody else. And they get jealous and they get insecure and they're challenged because it doesn't feel good to punish your children and control them all day. But you were trained as a parent by our culture to do it. Even in the early, early months, you know, your instinct was telling you not to put that baby down when they were crying to be held or to feed that baby when they were hungry. And so many people were told not to give in. Do not let that child manipulate you. And everything inside you told you the opposite. But yet you wanted to do the right thing. And, and so many parents wanted to have other people respect them as parents. There were so many layers of issues there. So when you're standing up for something so different, saying, no, I never bought into any of that. I listened to my heart from the beginning, and this is working. No, we're not raising ignorant children who are unsocialized. We are doing quite the opposite. It's your child that's in school all day, every day, against their will, on Ritalin, you know, labeled ADHD, ADD, every other label, and not happy going through life. Some parents just cannot be in a place of being confident enough to listen to their hearts because the criticism that what they think would come down on them is going to be overwhelming, but I'll tell you, You'd be surprised with how much support you get when you're confident on this path. When you when you kind of approach it in such a way where you're feeling insecure and you have to defend yourself. If you're insecure about this choice, of course, you're going to kind of look to others for approval. And so you put yourself in this position to kind of put yourself out there and like ask, so what do you think? And people are going to be like, I don't know. <laughs> and they're going to criticize you. You know, I'm really fascinated by my kids every day. I, I, I always wonder... You know, I'd love for Devin to be part of answering some of these questions because he doesn't have the conditioning even I have for some of these. So him answering, um, somebody posted their biggest challenge is um, converting their girlfriend before they have kids. <laughs> I mean, what if you had a girlfriend? What if Destiny said, like, I, I don't believe in unschooling and my kids will be in school? How do you think you would approach that? I don't know. I don't think I'd have a girlfriend with such a closed-minded attitude about it in the first place. Well, that's interesting. I, yeah, I hear you. What about this, though, Deb? Okay, let's ease some parents' minds. Somebody wants to know, um, one of their challenges is the fear that they're not doing enough or the fear that I'm holding them back. Like what if I was asked you just authentically, do you think I'm holding you back by not putting you in school? And no. I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. With what I want to do in life? No. Um, it all depends on what you want to do. If you want to be a surgeon, you're going to have to go to school for it, in my opinion. I mean, you can't be a surgeon without going to medical but school. But how many kids do you know that have freedom would make that choice, do you think? I... Wants to be a surgeon. <laughs> so, so, so you, like, let's just talk about like, say you wanted to be a surgeon. I, I don't think that it would be one thing that we share about is that when you're internally motivated, then you know the hoops that you need to jump through. You yeah. know that you need to go to college and you know, I mean, there's unschoolers in Harvard right now. Yeah. 
I mean, I think if you if you wanted to be a surgeon, it wouldn't be to please me. It would be because you'd want to, and so you'd make, take the necessary steps. Mm-hmm. But do you think that um, I'm holding you back? No, not at all. So you hear, heard it from the mouth of the babes. But but I think it's normal, fear that I'm not doing enough. There's There's times where... You know, it doesn't happen often, but there's times where everything is peaceful and everyone's occupied and I'm sitting there wondering, you know, should I be facilitating something or what should I be doing? And I think during those times where you're really fearing that you're not doing enough to check in with your kids. I mean, if they're old enough to ask them, just is there anything you want me to facilitate? Is there anything you want me to do? And if you're feeling you're not like you're not doing enough, then maybe jump online and Google something that they're interested in. If you need to be doing something, I think people are so used to controlling their kids that it really does feel like you're not doing enough when you first step into this life. I've noticed that with so many parents. And so I think that's a really normal fear and concern. So instead of, but it could be that you're not facilitating. Maybe you are fearing that you're not doing enough because you know what you don't want to do. You're not controlling and you're not a teacher taking a traditional homeschooling role, standing in front of them, pouring knowledge into them. Um, and so maybe you're not doing anything because you don't know what to do in its place. So what do you do in its place? You facilitate their learning based on their interests. So you do some research. I mean, I ordered Devin some books about blacksmithing. I knew that he was interested in what he was interested with nature. So we booked this class. I mean, you have to facilitate their learning. This is a very hands-on role. Unschooling is not for the lazy parent because you're doing something instead of a traditional role, but you're not doing nothing. So I think that's where the whole kind of bad rap on schooling gets. But I think it's really common for people coming to this life for the first step to be to let go of what they don't want to do, what they know they don't want to do. And sometimes there is a little bit of a process. Sometimes there is a little chaos before they learn what to replace it with. So I'm not sure what category this particular poster comes in in regards to this, but I hope I hope to answer that. Okay, so what about um, knowing somebody posted some of their challenges or knowing when I need to step in and when I need to back off? And I'm not sure if this is in regards to like fighting, children fighting or um, facilitating some kind of learning situation. But I think I just listen to my kids. (laughs) They, They ask, you know, knowing when to step in and when to back off. I think we think that it's this big mystery that we have to figure this out when in fact trust and communication with our kids, the answer is right there. I asked Devin, if do you need some help with something and he'll let me know. And if he want, you know, if I'm feeling like he's doesn't need me anymore for something, I mean, you asked me to come in the shop to watch you like all the time and you let me know, okay, I'm done. So I'll go back to Reiki or whatever. <laughs> Why do you like to show me things like when you're know. out there? Like I, and I love it. I feel like I'd love to see what you're doing. Is it helpful for you to show me what you're doing? I don't know. I just think that blacksmithing is really interesting. I want to show people because I don't think a lot of people, I think people should know more about it. Well, I'm fascinated with it and I love when he invites me in and I think it really helps solidify your learning of what you're sharing with somebody too. There's a certain aspect of natural learning that you really do crave showing somebody. So no matter how old your child is, I think when they say, mom, come watch this or mom, look what I'm doing. It's so, so important to, jump on that and, and respect that and go out and watch it, whether it's jumping on the trampoline or um, watching them do a, a Ivy doing cartwheels. She loves to show me what she's learned. And so does Devin. And that's part of your role as an involved connected parent with natural learning is to be there because that is part, that is just important as facilitating learning by offering resources is to be there to bear witness and to be present because that will help solidify everything they've learned and allow them to feel heard and respected and connected That's such a big part of learning. People don't look at it emotionally sometimes, but learning is really deeply powerful. It's emotional. It's it's personal. There's so many layers of needs that need to be met through to get for really, truly effective learning. Time to myself just keeps coming up over and over again. And I just want to assure you that they're um, finding, I think it's such a cultural thing because when a, when a parent's controlling a child all day and punishing and needing to enforce and manipulate. And so many people don't know that they're doing it. There's so many different layers, but it's not pleasant. It's not joyful to control children all day, every day. So needing a break from that is so understandable. When you're living in a joyful mentality and partnership parenting, I don't think that is quite as needed 
because what you're doing feels really good and you're having fun most of the time and connected. I mean, there's days where I just need to kind of get out because the energy is so buzzing and it's not a negative thing. It's just everybody is intensive into what they're doing. And I just need to sometimes go outside and sit on the lawn, but I take responsibility for that. I think so many times we look to others, whether it's our partners or our children to almost give us permission And if you don't know what I mean by that, really just sit with it for a minute. We're looking for permission from our partners to recognize that we need a break because everything was so indirect when we were growing up. Everything was so indirect. Um, Everybody, most people had a really hard time communicating. There was no communication. There was either force, control, or coercion. So really tapping into your needs. Uh, your, Your needs were so ignored generally. The needs of the adults around you came first and foremost. And so you really became disconnected with what your needs really were. Not only that, but let alone even asking for, I mean, recognizing that you need what your needs are and then taking a break when you need it. That's part of it. It's such an important responsibility walking this path for so many reasons. For one, again, this is a very hands on role facilitating children's learning all day, every day, whether you have one child or six children. It's a very hands on active role. In order to be there and do a good job with all of it, you do need to take the responsibility to meet your own needs. Uh, The analogy of being on an airplane and giving your child oxygen first before you, I mean, giving yourself oxygen first before giving oxygen to your child is so essential because if you're not meeting those needs, you're not going to be able to be there for them. So you have to realize, take that responsibility. And if you don't do it for yourself, do it for them. Not only for being able to be present and have your cup full, Having a full cup is so important. And I mean, just a full cup, a full cup of energy, a full cup of love, whatever you want to call it. But I always try to keep my cup not only full, but overflowing. And you need, you really need to do it to model to your children. I mean, children learn what they live. What do they learn from martyrdom? What do they learn from a parent who just does for others all day, but not for themselves? They're learning from that just as much as you learned and were conditioned by doing the opposite, by, you know, by a parent forcing you to meet their needs, you learned from that. So you need to take responsibility. You don't want to be a martyr. That's not, that's not noble. That's not noble to me. It's not noble in this more evolved approach to parenting because um, your children are learning. That's how to be. And it's very disempowering. So when you take responsibility to meet your own needs and that your needs should never tromp over somebody else's needs. You gotta just get really good with going with the flow with the energy. When everybody's occupied, you sit down with a cup of tea, grab a magazine, put your feet up, give yourself a little foot bath at night. You know, there's nothing wrong with doing things to kind of pamper yourself because no one else is going to and to expect your husband or partner. I mean, if you, if you have a really in tune partner and they, awesome if they say, honey, why don't you go take a bath? But I know in my family, my husband's not noticing when I need a break. And I'm not really necessarily noticing when he does because everybody's has a different threshold, a different journey with it all. So he takes responsibility to say, I'm going to go for a drive. I'm going to go take some photos and me not making him feel guilty or bad for it, just completely supporting him and, and him doing the same. Like I plan on after this radio show, I haven't taken a bath in a while. I want a nice bath with some, some of the bath salts I made recently because I just had a long walk and I really want to do that. And then maybe I'll fold laundry after we'll see. <laughs> but Taking responsibility to meet your own needs, your children learn that is what you should do. Because you can't expect other people to do it all the time. You don't need permission from someone else either. Give yourself permission. All right, Devin, is there anything? I can't believe the show went by so quick. Tell me, um, do you have anything else you want to say or that's on your mind? Well, I was just wondering why this map says Alexander Gross on it. I was going to say Gross. Devin's room is wallpapered with maps, (laughs) which I love. I love, love, love that it is. It's like total immersion learning. That was something that's so important uh, to facilitate your child's learning is to surround them with a life rich with resources. Literally, I'm totally surrounded with maps right now. (laughs) But I love that we have a really big library of books, too, because you do. I've seen you grab books off the shelf. I've read every, every page of every one of my books. I, like I said before, I really like books, but I don't think that they're they're not as disposable as the internet is, and it takes much longer to learn from them. I think, in the sense that you have to rate, you have to make the money, and if you're ordering them online, well, there's no point in that because you're already online. But right, I, know. I know what you mean. You don't want to buy. You don't want to spend. Devin does not like to spend money on things that he doesn't need to spend money on, which I love. 
you know, that you can be that type of person that can, I love books and holding them. I love buying books. <laughs> I know. That's one of my like guilty pleasures. I just ordered this book that I got a uh, sexy bitch. I just got not sexy bitch. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's like half my book. Half It's skinny bitch. That's what it was. I think I need to write one called sexy bitch. Though. Yeah, no, it's too similar to the other one. I know. Like, right. A little off putting, but the uh, skinny bitch, it's about the food industry and it's kind of review for me. And it's interesting the way that it's worded. It's so, um, kind of street in its language, you know, like really, uh, swears a lot, but it's pretty good. Was just, there was a lot of hype around the book, Skinny Bitch, and I actually bought it for a few friends and I hadn't read it yet, so, but it I love <laughs> It's okay, it's pretty good. How do you know I haven't read it? What? How you haven't read it? No, I've read like half of it. I just oh, got it yesterday. Oh, okay. But I, I read nice. it in bed last night. You read half a book in that much time? It's, yeah. yeah, well, I'd love to read. And well, I, how big, how big is it? I don't know. It's, it's just a, you can go look, I think it's 200 pages or something. Um, but it's a really easy read. But I love books. I love buying books. I'm going to go buy one again tonight, I think. You can get them so cheap. Get them two or three bucks used. Half.com has tons of books. And you can sell books on there too. All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. And thanks again to Dave Lizzo for my intro and my outro, which should be kicking in soon. Dave and his uh, wife, Liz, took a private childbirth class for me, which was so amazing. And uh, it was so fun to connect with people. I've connected with so many interesting people on this path. So many people have connected with me seeing through seeing us on television and um, just being inspired by learning about this life. I'm sure that people are aware of being on TV that you do get criticism, but I'll tell you, it's probably 10 to one positive. I have received so many messages and emails in the last year or two of the different stuff we've done for people that did not know about this option until they heard about it and it's changed their lives. So I get messages and emails almost daily from people who have seen us on one of our shows. And um, even though on the, on the surface, it looks like really sensationalized, the people that are ready for it will be tuned into it and will hear the message under the words and will research it. So that's why I keep saying yes. I keep showing up and saying yes, no matter what opportunity comes. And I know that it's all meant to be. So guys, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Thank you, Devin, for being my co-host. You're awesome as usual. Um, thank you to all my listeners. And I would love for you to connect with me here on uh, UCY. Send me messages ideas for new shows and please comment if you're watching this on listening to this on YouTube. I'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you guys. Have a great week.